All right. Um, so hi, everyone. I am Aditya. I'm a graduate student from UIUC. And uh, today, I'll be talking about our experiences running Charm++ on Kubernetes Cloud. So before I start, I'd like to thank the IBM Illinois Discovery Accelerator Institute for funding this project and all the collabor collaborators from both UIUC and IBM for their contributions. So over the last few years, we have seen an increasing availability and adoption of HPC Cloud resources. According to this study that was conducted in 2023, over the next five years, uh, the cloud HPC spending is expected to grow at a much higher rate than the HPC um, on-premises spending. But according to the same study, out of the 60% of the HPC sites that are currently using cloud, only 29% of their HPC workload runtime was in fact running on the cloud. And so while we have seen an increasing availability and adoption, there is still ample room for growth. The demand for HPC cloud resources is now even higher with an increasing demand for AI workloads running on the cloud. And so now more than ever, we need a way to run HPC applications with efficient utilization of cloud resources. For our study, we used Charm++, which is a parallel programming framework that provides a programming model that matches well with the cloud philosophy. I'll start with a quick background of Charm++. It is a parallel programming framework with an adaptive runtime system. Applications here, uh, something like MPI, but instead of being written in terms of ranks and processes, are written in terms of objects, which are also called as chars. And then the mapping of these objects to physical processors is managed by the runtime system. Charm++ is used in highly scalable scientific applications such as NAMD, which is a molecular dynamic simulation software, Changa, an astrophysics simulation software, and there are many others. Charm++ is available in both C++ and Python. In Python, it's called Charm for Pi. And while Charm++ has been traditionally used for scientific applications, it is more recently being explored for AI applications as well. So let's look at, take a quick look at how Charm++ works. So imagine you have a system with four processors and you want to write your program with six objects. You start by creating a char array or a collection of objects of size six. These six objects are then distributed by the runtime system on these four processors. In order to communicate between these objects, you can call a function on one of the objects from anywhere in the system. So for example, in this case, a, the function foo is called on a of two from a of one. And internally, the runtime system will send a message from processor zero, which is where a of one resides, to processor one, which is where a of two resides. And then the function foo will be executed on processor one. There can also be multiple types of char arrays. Um, in this case, there are two types of char arrays, A and B. And these chars or objects are migratable, which means the runtime system can move around these objects um, between processors without the user having to write explicit code for it. And this enables some neat features such as dynamic rescaling. So let's say you're, let's say you're running a program with four processors and you want to in the middle of the execution, change it to run on just three processors. The runtime system can move objects from one of the processors and distribute it across others, and then just continue execution with three processors. The migratability concept also results in some other features, such as dynamic load balancing and fault tolerance, which I won't talk about in this talk. Now, why are we trying to run Champ++ on Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes has become a de facto standard for container orchestration on the cloud over the last few years and it provides operators for job scheduling and lifecycle management. In particular, for this project, we have used Kubeflow's MPI operator quite extensively. MPI operator is used for running MPI applications, and we found that minimal changes to the MPI operator were required to be, to be able to run Champ++ applications as well. Kube, Kubernetes also supports dynamic rescaling of resources, and while we only support CPUs right now, uh, we plan to support GPUs in the future as well. Uh, on the left is an example of an MPI operator YAML file. Uh, I won't go into each of, each of these specs in detail, but a couple of things that I'll point out. Uh, first, you define a launcher and a worker. The launcher is where your MPI run command is defined. In the workers, you define a number of replicas, and that is the number of workers that will be launched. So in this case, there go there, there's going to be four workers and one launcher where you run the MPI run command. Now, coming to the efficiency part of the equation, how do we get, um, how do we use MPI operator to be able to efficiently use cloud resources? So the objective here is to maximize job throughput on a fixed size cluster while minimizing wait time for high priority jobs. 
And in order to do this, we modified the MPI operator CRD to include a couple of additional fields. Firstly, we added a job priority field. And secondly, we changed the worker spec to uh, replace the replicas field with min replicas and max replicas, which is the min and maximum number of workers that can be launched for a job. And the number of workers that are launched is determined by the MPI operator's controller at runtime based on the state of the cluster. We also modified the controller for elastic scheduling. So let's look at how this elastic scheduling works. When a new job is submitted, we first check if we have enough available CPUs for running this new job at its min replicas configuration. If we do, then we just start running this new job. If not, then we check if there are any running jobs that are a lower priority than this new job. If this new job is the lowest priority job that is submitted to the system, then we have to queue this job because we can't scale down any of the higher priority jobs. But if there are some lower priority jobs that are running on the system, we iterate over those lower priority jobs and we scale them down to min replicas, to their min replicas configuration to free up some CPUs. If we are able to free up enough CPUs, then we run this new job, otherwise we queue it. And similarly, when a job finishes execution, we it frees up some CPUs that can be reassigned to some of the other uh, jobs. So we iterate over all of the running and queued jobs in decreasing order of priority, and we reassign these CPUs by scaling up, either scaling up running jobs or by starting some new queued jobs. So here's a quick example of what this actually looks like. So I'm going to start by submitting a, a lower priority job, which is going to start running with four workers. And then I'm going to submit a higher priority job. When I submit a higher priority job, the lower priority job is getting rescaled to run with just two workers instead of four. And the two freed workers are now assigned to this new uh, higher priority job. Later, when this higher priority job finishes execution, the workers that get freed are now reassigned back to the older low priority job, like we see happening here. And now this older low priority job is again rescaled up to run with four workers instead of two. We also measured the rescaling overhead uh, for a 2D stencil problem, which is a typical, problem, typical, typical scientific problem uh, used for benchmarking. Uh, and we saw that the rescaling overhead was pretty high when we used smaller problem sizes because the actual runtime itself was pretty small. But as the problem size increased, the overhead actually dropped to much smaller than 10%. And uh, that's all for my talk today. Uh, here's the links to my group webpage uh, if you want to learn more about Champ++. Plus Plus. And feel free to reach out to us. Our group is a traditional HPC group. and. Uh, so we really value your feedback um, on how we can make this thing uh, better. Thank you.